Hi everyone. Hello. Hi Mary. Welcome to our new venue. What do you think? It's cool. Yeah, I really like it. And for people who are watching on the video, there's actually a beautiful garden and a big field on two sides of us that you won't see on the camera probably. But it's just gorgeous summer afternoon. Yeah. Um, so b before we start, I'd really like to thank Peter and Claire for donating the venue to us. They're not they're not here, but yeah, but very generous and just a lovely space, I reckon. Peter's actually hurt himself. He fell off a ladder and has broken his leg, so he's had to have major surgery on it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, his right one. Right, it was left the other one. Yeah, yep. And thanks to all the people who came early and helped set up. It was a bit of... We had a few uh, interesting... We created a sale at the back and nearly lost the... Um, <laughs> um, but we got it all sorted, so it's good. Yeah, very good. All right, so let's get on to Chapter 13. Finally, huh? So the name of this chapter is Two Illustrations. And what do, you, what do you think of this chapter overall? Lovely? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, well, you know, I think they're all magic. But, um, yeah, this one has got some really good stuff in it, I reckon. So who wants to um, tell us what the first illustration was in the chapter? Nina, yeah? Um... Fred's desire to sort of communicate back with the earth realm was um, not actually brought about, I guess, but he was shown in the first part of the chapter the challenges that would happen as a, or do happen as a result of that. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was a really perfect illustration, I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So remember um, in the shortest, longest chapter in the book, chapter 12... <laughs> Um, at the end of the chapter, we saw a woman being drawn back to the earth plane, didn't, didn't we? And she was um, being pulled. Oh, yeah, that was in chapter 12, wasn't it? And so we followed her back and her name is Lizzie. So did anyone have any questions, first of all, about this first illustration before we get into talking about it a bit more? Yeah, if we go back. Uh, I'm just wondering if... Somebody lives uh, in the spirit world, lives in the spirit world, and the power of the family is it so strong to can pull this being down here? Yeah, well, what does the chapter show yeah, us? It says it. So I, I have the question. Yeah. If um, the person has, has, have they got a free will not to come down? Yes, they do. Okay, that's no one loses their free will. But what did you what did you see with this woman, with Lizzie in the chapter? What what was she compelled by really? About the love of the family. Yeah, if you uh, not quite. If you pass back to Suzanne, the grief. The grief yeah, I think it's building on the theme of the sympathy. Yes. Yeah, she had yeah. this, yeah. She yeah. great love for her sister, obviously, and so it was really magnetic. Yeah, because in, in the first scene we see her sister, Sarah, sitting by her grave and sobbing and sobbing and sobbing, don't we? And Lizzie is drawn back through this kind of love, which it's called, for her sister to be with her. So she has free will, but as we see in every chapter, it's not an intellectual will. This is so important for all of us to understand that we think of free will as, oh, yeah, I'll just make the decision. But does it really work like that? No, it's what's in our soul that actually directs our will every single time. Now, sometimes we can override the injury in our soul and use our will in a different direction, but where does that, where does that decision come from? Is it just from our intellect? No. What else is it from? <laughs> uh, if we come forward to Deirdre for that one. Yeah. It's generally from a desire that's stronger than the 
injury or the fear or something. Exactly. Yeah. It, the desire has outweighed the anger or the fear or the shame or whatever and we've decided to take a different route even though the injury wants to keep us in addiction. So in the end, it's still something from our soul that's caused us to use our will in a different direction. Yeah. So, yes, very important illustration that happens all through the book. If you think back to Marie, hey, with In the Harvest of Jealousy, she was just completely driven by these emotions that she didn't want to feel or she wanted to live in the angry expression of. And then as soon as she decided to humble herself, humble her soul and feel what was really there, she was immediately transported somewhere else under that desire as well. Yeah. Okay, so... What about any reflections you had from this first illustration? What struck you about it? Obviously, the, th the feeling that, wow, we can actually be pulled back to earth through this thing. What did you think about the emotion between the two women? What was happening? Barbara? For me, that brought me a lot of grief because um, the love between two sisters. Yeah. I, I reflected on my love for my sisters and I don't think uh, I would be in that position either way on the grave or in the heaven and that happening so I just felt a lot of grief around my lack of love for my sisters yeah so you feel sort of quite disconnected from your yeah. sisters yeah 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 okay what else anyone else yeah if we go to Yvonne and Diana then we'll it just no just made me um, think about Mary like if that's the effect that grief has on w when we're projecting it to someone then what effect is it having when we're jealous or anger or fear or any of the others yes yeah you know, brought that home yeah so do you think she's feeling what is Sarah feeling do I I felt like there was um this need in Sarah to have her pain alleviated and Lizzie had this attraction with um, wanting to alleviate her sister's grief. It felt like that was the hook between yep. Yeah, the there's a f the feeling. There's definitely a feeling between them that she doesn't want to feel all of her pain. Um, that's true, but can we say there's no love between them? No. No, no, no definitely no. was love yep. between them. Yes, yeah. And just going back to Yvonne's point, so this idea of what do our emotions bring to us or what do our emotions projected, what do they, how do they affect other people? Yeah, which they actually affect quite a lot. If you think about um, In the Harvest of Jealousy with Marie and was it Charles, her ex-husband? Charlie, he just had to think of her and she was immediately brought back and we didn't hear much about what his feelings were but he obviously had some unresolved feeling with her that he hadn't grieved or hadn't let go of and bam they're brought back into sympathetic attraction again so yes I, th I believe it has a huge impact yeah yeah if we go back to Gary then across to Jen yep I was just wondering Mary like you know my mum died like you like you cry like is there like a way you can have like healthy grief like like yeah. is there any way that because <laughs> like it doesn't seem possible really like <laughs> why do you say that gary well because when you're grieving it was a, you're grieving because you're lonely you know because you you want something from the person that, yeah. that has passed so like and this is a really important thing that i wanted to raise with you guys today um the, there's a lot in this illustration that we're given not surprisingly but um one of these is, why do you think, firstly, that Lizzie was kept asleep for so long? If you Can you answer that, Gary? Um, she had, like, he heaps of, heaps of industry. She was exhausted from, from, from everybody's pull on her and trying to keep, keep the family happy and all that. Yeah, stuff. could be that. What else could it be? Well, it is partly that, but it is partly something else. Mainly something else, actually. Yeah, if we go all the way back to Alwyn. We might need a mic runner in this because we're a bit further apart. Yeah. Um, to protect her from the grief of others? Yes, mm. yes, yeah. To protect her from this pool of others. But let's go back to Gary's question, which is, is there any kind of pure grief? 
So, and remember before I asked you, what is Sarah feeling at the graveside? Her loss. But is she really feeling it? No. She's feeling, she's feeling some of it, but she's certainly not surrendered to this feeling of loss. Because what would happen if she surrendered to the feeling of loss? Deirdre? Uh, Lizzie wouldn't be pulled to her. She, yes, she would Not as strongly. Yep. And if Lizzie did come to her, what would happen, do you think? She may have been able to hear her more. Yes. But like be open to a bit more truth. Definitely, because she's more humble. Yeah. So we can see here, can't we, that humility always opens the door to truth. So we know that Sarah is grieving, but she, there's, not, there's not purity, if you like, in her grief. There's still a feeling of, I just want her back, I just want her back, which is opposite of what is true grief. It's feeling the loss, recognising the loss, acknowledging the loss, embracing the loss, feeling it and releasing it. So Sarah, she's teetering between these two states, it seems, doesn't it? I've lost my sister, I'm, you know, I love her and I'm crying, but there's also a feeling which you can all, can you relate to? <laughs> when someone passes or even when you lose a relationship that you feel really attached to, there's a huge feeling, oh, I just want it back, I just want it back, I'd have anything to have it back. And that's the impurity in the grief, if you like. And that's the, the thing that leads to addiction in our lives. And it's also the thing that is causing this big pull on Lizzie. Apart from also her genuine love for her sister and regard for her and her sister's feeling for her as well. So there's a love there, but there's also this unwillingness to really surrender to the grief. What would happen if she really surrendered to the grief? And I just touched on it there with Deirdre. Jen? I feel it would pass and be transformed into, I don't know what it would be individual, I, I would imagine. Yeah. So another, another feeling or understanding she'd move on to. Well, let's put it to you guys. Um, who's lost a parent or a child or a spouse to death? Yeah? Okay. What were some of the feelings that... That's nearly everyone. Um, what were some of the feelings that you went through initially? Yep, Jen? Um, referring to my mum, uh, just um, that she was so unique and had a unique place in my life that couldn't be fulfilled by anyone else. So the fact that she was so unique um, and that, that... So what's the feeling that you had, um, though, associated with that? I don't know. Loss. Just... Loss, yeah. yeah. Okay. What else? A feeling that you had to have her back because she was so unique? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who else? What other feelings? Ange? Um, I, I just remember um, when my dad passed, I... It was just a feeling of... Um, it's all about me. It's, it's kind of like it's my thing and... Um, I, I, I can't go... It's too much for me, you mean? Like, no, it was like it was my loss and I wasn't feeling for him. I wasn't, yeah. you know, and then I realised that and pulled myself up and stopped grieving, you know, because I didn't yeah. know what else to do. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good way you put it though, my loss. Yeah. Yeah. I've lost something, yeah. What other feelings? If you go to Sandra and back to Rita. Um, for me it's like it's unfair that it's not... Like, yeah. why should I lose this person that I want to be with me? Injustice, it's yeah. not fair. Yep. And it's, again, I love how you've said that, Sandra. You've said, it's not fair that they can't be with me. It's not about them even there, is it? So, yep, what other feelings, Rita? Yeah, I felt anger, a bit of anger, yep. which I wouldn't have noticed at that time. But in retrospect, I realised it was anger. Anger, yep. Okay, uh, Lorleen and Barbara. Oh, we'll go to Graham then, Barbara. Yeah. Um, I felt um, helpless. Um, yeah. I felt my dad was in a really bad spot and he'd be in a really terrible place where he'd go. 
So, so you felt helpless to help him? Yeah. Yeah. And what, what's under that feeling? Because that's a good one. Um, I see that as an addiction, as why I can't get to him as much as, you know, like to, to process things. So what's your addiction in that feeling, do you feel? Um, uh, I, I've had that for both parents that I've wanted to help them. I've known they're both in bad places and I guess that my addiction is that I don't, being concentrating on them, I don't concentrate on myself. I yeah, and uh, Lorraine, do you think it could be this? Uh, Guilt? Yeah. I'm responsible for them? Yeah, I feel really, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, who was it, Graham? Yeah. Um, I actually felt happy for both my mum and my dad. Yeah. Because their suffering was over. Yeah. So you felt a relief at their release from, yeah. I, I, that's a great one, but I don't want to put it on this list, so I'm putting it on the side. Uh, so you have actually felt sort of relieved for them. This is the first emotion that's about them, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Who else was next? Someone on this side. Barbara, yep. I need a bigger whiteboard, definitely. Yeah. Um, I remember sitting in the church after Mum died and I felt like a stunned mullet. Shock. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Very common. Okay. Who else? Diana, yeah? Just um, hearing relief. I have to say I felt relief for me because of uh -huh. the care that yes. I had given to you. Yes. Those so people. unburdened and, yep, okay. Yep, if we pass back to Raj. Uh, <clears throat> for my father, uh, holding his hand, in the last, well, it was just after he died, just a moment or two afterwards, um, I just felt such huge gratitude for having had him as a father. Yep, yeah. Um, but for my mother, who passed 10 years earlier, um, I felt nothing. It was just cold. So uh, sort of numb? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it frightened me for a long time because yeah. uh, I had no feelings at all. Yeah. And I, I projected that onto the fact that I had to take care of my father and do the arrangements and yeah. everything. And so I busied myself to avoid, avoid the feelings. Have you ever revisited it, Raj? Yeah. What do you feel it was about? Mm. I think it was um, uh, almost a sense of revenge for um, not being loved. Yeah, how harshly yeah. she treated yeah. you very yeah. harshly, didn't she? Well, I don't think so, but um, but, and but there was something was dreadfully missing. Yeah, and y we've talked personally yeah. about this, obviously, that your mum was <laughs> quite <laughs> Endlessly. harsh. Yeah, and it is something that... You find difficult to connect to her. You can see really? it, but you, you're emotionally quite afraid of your mum still. So, you, yeah. And this is what I wanted to point out to everyone. I feel like there's all these feeling, hurt feelings, angry feelings inside of you, but because there's an injury set up inside of you that you're afraid of your mum and I can't, then we just go numb. Yeah. yeah. And that happens for quite a lot of people when somebody passes, especially those of us who've had like a a fractured or a difficult relationship with a parent and we haven't resolved it while they're still on earth and they pass, it very often, if you look at families, the, the child that has the most difficulty with that parent, will oft, it will often bring up all of these things when that parent passes. And if, we, if we're afraid of what's coming up, we just zone out and go numb. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if we go, yep, to Julianne and to Jen, was this? Oh, Bob, were you next? I'm done. I'm done. You, that's right. Yep. Yep. Oh, you, okay. Julie, yep. yep. uh, Mum had a lot of terror. Yep. At passing. Yeah, yeah. but how did you feel? Um, f terrified for her. Uh huh. Yep. So you took on her feelings. And how did you feel after she passed? Still afraid? Um, disconnected. Yeah, so similar to Raj yeah. there. Yeah. 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 Okay, Jen. So I'm not sure if this is the right time to ask this question, but uh, what do you do with the attachment that you have with the person 
who's passed, both at their passing, I felt um, an overwhelming attachment to mum and, um, yeah, uh, what do you, so that's the question. What do you do? I'm with getting there. I'm uh, getting there. Okay. okay. So Igor had his hand up. We'll go to Igor and then we'll... I just experienced the loss of my father. He died in my arms, but um, I felt relieved for myself, relieved for him. And then I felt guilty that I'm feeling relieved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have all these ways of like shutting down our own emotional process, hey? Sometimes we, if we allow the relief, uh, suddenly it ends up just naturally in the grief of all kinds of things that have happened in our life. But because we feel like I must be bad, I'm relieved that this I should, person... I should be grieving. I yeah, should be grieving. yeah. Um, we, we shut down a lot of these things. And that leads us to Jen's question because all of these things, the even the relief that you had for yourself, the shock, the numb, the guilt, the anger, it's all about me, the injustice, what are all these emotions? Especially actually when we go numb. What does that... What does that do to our soul, all the emotions in our soul? Nina? Well, at that point, we're in denial. We're in denial. So what happens with, with our soul and the people around our soul? What starts coming out of us? This is really important, guys. Yeah. Ange? Um, anger. No. Yeah, or... Any yeah, of those. Any of those. Yeah. But it, this is the thing. It comes out of us more. Yes. Okay. When we surrender to it, it's ours. <laughs> when we shut it down or we get angry, it's coming out of us. And this is what forms a big attachment to the people, around, to the people who've passed. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah? Jen doesn't see that, no. So let's so pass the mic to Jen. Yep. What's the question? I would say I loved my mother and I still love my mother, but there's this attachment that I have reflected on through this example which, call, which calls out to her. And I'm not sure about that. In, I don't know how to balance the scales in terms of love and, and it's Jen, muddled up. This is where we need humility because what's confounding you is that you're not willing to be humble to the feelings that are there. So you're just calling it an attachment and a feeling like you want her to be with you. Now, you know there's some feelings of love inside you for your mother, but there's this whole other lot of emotions inside of you that you don't want to touch. And so you just go, I've just got an attachment to her and I, what is that? And that's where it requires your self-reflection to feel what are the real emotions I have with my mum that would cause me to want her to be with me? Because wouldn't you want her to go on and have a great life? Her life isn't over. So wouldn't you want her to go on and keep growing, learn, have adventures, all of those things? If you loved her, you, that's what you would want. Yes. Yeah. So this, is, this emotion that you, you're sensing is telling you, wow, I've got... And I'm suggesting to you that there's some of these emotions inside of you that you haven't dealt with and that's causing an attachment to her. So the answer to my question is, is that attachment is, is not loving. Is that correct? Well, it, we're getting down to yeah, semantics said, now. Somebody said it was an, it's a part of an addiction. Well, addiction is unloving. Yeah. But I don't know what you mean by the word attachment in this context. I feel we've illustrated what happens when, I, when I'm not humble, when I'm not humble to my loss, when I'm not humble to these feelings, then I create a projection which causes... a like a draw on that person. And unless they're also humble, they're going to be pulled back in towards me. Unless, unless they I shouldn't say also, unless they are humble themselves, they will feel compelled to come back through whatever unresolved emotions they have with me. Okay. So another example I had 
that I couldn't really resolve was the loss of a child, the loss of my daughter. I felt incredibly attached to the loss of her, yet at the same time there's this feeling that you just described about Mum, the feeling that I'd want her to be having a full life and off in the spirit world doing whatever. So um, I'm saying so to you there's things inside of you that relate to you, what you wanted in your relationship with both these females that is causing an ongoing... And I'm not going to use the word attachment because I don't think... What you're describing is a feeling, I want them with me. Yes, it is. Yeah. And if you... The thing is, when we really love, we respect the free will of everyone else. So we can desire for a per to share company with a person. But that's very different from this feeling of like, no, I want them with me. I've got it. Got it? Cool. Okay. Thank was you there, very much. No worries. Was there questions on... No? Did you? Um. And Lorleen? Yep. I'm still going with this though, so unless it's... It, are we on topic? Yep. Yeah, I was just wanting to clarify, but I think I've got it, and that is in the same way that Sarah was kind of needy of Lizzie and that's what was pulling her back, any of this, these denied emotions can have the same effect on somebody else. I'm not saying can, they, they do. do. They it. definitely do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and we'll get back to Lizzie and Sarah as yeah. well because it... Yep, Lorleen. Um, when my brother died, um, uh, I didn't go to the funeral because I thought the best way to do it was uh, to, to look after his son. There was a big accident. And um, I thought that um, uh, I felt to myself that if I went to the funeral, I was just grieving myself and it wouldn't help anyone. And the best help I could offer was to look after his son. But what I'm asking is, um, it was a time after that I actually felt the grief of his loss. So I, I'm asking, because I didn't acknowledge it at the time of his death, um, the grief that I really did feel, um, does that mean I was in some sort of illusion that I, you know what I'm asking? No, I'm not, I wasn't feeling the real grief at the time of his death. Yeah. So that means then I had grief in me, but I didn't feel it. Yep. So I was pulling him anyway. Okay. That's my question. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Yes, technically, yes. But this is the purpose of, especially this happens when someone has a very dramatic accident in the mid of their life and nobody is expecting the death. Nobody has engaged any kind of grieving process about this person happening. So God, in his huge love, <laughs> has designed a process where people are often sleeping for a long time so that people have the opportunity... Oops, oops, oops. <laughs> to go through these kinds of emotions. And if you think about in this chapter, that's exactly what's happening with Lizzie, isn't it? She's been put to sleep to give everyone a chance to deal with this. She wakes up, there's still a pull. And what does Krishna say to Fred? This could happen three or four more times before this is over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, what happened was that um, whenever I got into some strife, I used to just talk to him and tell him about everything and I was told that every time I do that I pull him back down to me and he can't progress on with because I keep you know complaining about something and he's out there to help me well then this is where I want to conclude this this point actually because my question to you now you guys now is okay we we realize a lot of these things happen when someone first passes now going back to Gary's point is this Pure grief? No. This is actually us avoiding pure grief. But very often it is a part of us getting to grief. <laughs> it's working through the addictive layers to get to the causal sadness. Do you all see that? Yep. Yeah? Okay. So then what happens when we really start grieving? What kind of feelings do we... And you know what I want to point out to you guys? Is most of you haven't ever done that. Most of you are still here with relationships and people who have passed. Yeah. But who feels like they have gone through some, some real grief at some point about something? What did it feel like? 
going on? Um, I've been doing a little bit more lately because I've been attracting my sister back quite a bit. Yeah. And um, it feels now when I can actually go into feeling my aloneness, that feels like it's really starting to help. Yeah. That those really painful things and and I'm becoming aware of how much I don't want to take responsibility for my own emotions. Yeah. 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 So if we... It's a good example because we're talking about sisters in the book. If we think about Lizzie and Sarah, at the moment there's like love. Both of them have a love for each other. At the start of the chapter, I mean, what we're seeing. But they also have this feeling of wanting to make it better for each other. That's a kind of an injury in their love. And it's actually preventing um, Sarah from really submitting to her grief, that false belief that she has about death and about her capacity to feel grief. So can you guys all relate to that when somebody has passed? Yeah. And Lizzie is drawn back. Lizzie's beliefs have changed. I'm not dead. I want to tell you, you know. But they're still in this kind of attraction. Now, when when um, Sarah moves to real grief, she, you're right. She would begin to not want to involve Lizzie in it and she would just feel wow, I feel alone or I feel whatever it is. And then another thing can happen as well. So at the moment, it's all about me, isn't it? <laughs> it's all about me if I'm the person who's lost someone. I want them back. It's not fair. I want them to be with me, all of these things. And you can see how unloving that is, can't you? Because we know they're not dead. So, or we believe, can we say, even if you... <laughs> um, they have, they're not really dead so why would we want them to just come and hang out with us all, all the time we'd want them to have their own life if we really had let go and we really loved them so but when we're in these addictive kind of emotions in our relationships we have this feeling come back give me a sense of worth make me feel whole make me feel not lonely all of those things okay then we move on to some more some more sincere grieving where it's just acknowledging the loss they're gone I'm not going to have them in the... Even if we believe in the spirit world, I'm not going to have them in my life in the way that I thought I was going to. And then we can even move into deeper emotions, which is about more of a sense of desire for them. I hope where they are is good. I hope that they can resolve things that I know that they had on earth. I can pray for them. And, you know, and this is the point that I was working my way around to. What do you think your relationship with them is like then? Is it this same kind of thing that we see at the start of the book? But would they come and see you? Yeah. Depending on where they're at, hey? Yeah. So in answer to your question, Lorleen, it depends on where you're at and where he's at as to what kind of interaction you have. If you have... If you haven't dealt with all of your grief and you, you still like have an addictive feeling, I want him to be here with me to make me feel like I've got a buddy and someone to talk about my problems with and, and he has a feeling, oh, I want to look after my sister and, and neither of you have kind of worked through those things or I need to look after my sister is probably a better way to put it, then you might be having this kind of interaction where he feels compelled. But if you've really grieved the loss and you just desire to talk to your brother as a mate and there's no big demand that he come to you, then it's up to him. Does he want to be there or not? Yep. Um, while he was on earth, he said a few, quite a lot of things to me to help me um, and I didn't understand. And when he died, it took many years for me to say, oh, is that what you meant? And it was in the grief of that moment of realising what he was trying to do for me that I used to want to talk to him and say, I'm sorry, I didn't understand then. Yeah. yeah. And do you feel that that was a negative thing? No. No. No, that you actually have a loving desire toward him in that moment, don't you? You have a feeling of like, oh, thanks. Oh, you know, thanks for that thing you did for me. There's not... And depending on where he's at and what's happening for him, he'll, he'll either come and receive that or, you know, he's, do, he's doing his own thing. But you don't have this feeling that you must come and look after me. So, yeah. Is there any other questions on that point? Sandra? I have a question about the 
purple color purple between the girls like what yeah I know that emotions are colour and it's really intriguing and I'd like to know what that purple is. Is that what we're just talking about? Is that the feeling or is it more the feeling that's drawing them together? It's more about the love. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anything else? No? Good reflections about grief, guys, and, uh, and where we're at with grief, what impact it has on the people around us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what happens next? They, Lizzie can't, uh, Sarah can't hear Lizzie and then all of a sudden what happens? The sympathy grows so strong and suddenly she can hear her sister. And so Sarah gets elated. Wow, you know, she's not really dead. And then what happens? Or <laughs> well, how did you feel about what happens next, Barbara? I wondered why she didn't stay there and feel the feeling longer and um, enjoy communicating with her sister, but she just had to run off and tell everybody and it spoilt the whole feeling for her because nobody then believed her. <laughs> but can you imagine, or I can imagine, I've had this experience where you think somebody is dead, gone, forever. We're never go- I'm never going to have a conversation with that person again I'm never going to feel them near me again I'm never going to feel all of those things and a whole group of people around me are grieving exactly the same thing the minute that they came and said I'm not dead I'm still here it's all good I'd be like uh, out of compassion for all of you Joy Barbara Nina it's okay they're not dead it's good we can talk to them you know so I kind of understand why she did it well you did that in the first century yeah yeah. (laughs) that's why I can relate to the feeling yeah 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 but I I felt and maybe it's that was a selfish feeling but my my felt that wow she really could have got a lot out of that by just hanging on for those few more moments yeah. and, and shared a conversation with her sister and and yeah. it wouldn't have mattered what everybody else thought at the end of the day because yeah. she really did feel that experience because really now she's not sure if she did feel that experience. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Have any of you had that experience as a child or where, yep, yeah, Sarah has. Do you want to talk about it or you don't have to? If you point that camera at me and then Lena can point that camera at you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just as a medium, like not necessarily my family, but lots of times. And when you hear someone, you're just like so excited. You definitely want to tell someone. But when then you just get the projections, oh, you're crazy, you're stupid and you just... And you start to question yourself too. You go, oh, maybe that didn't really happen. or, And just, yeah, just people like... I talked to someone's grandparent. That was, I think, the first mediumistic experience I had. And and I just started saying his name and all this sort of stuff. And it was my boyfriend at the time, actually. And he said, um, did you ask my cousin about this? Or, you know... And then yeah. I told my family about it. And they're like, yeah, I think you knew that already. And, you know... <laughs> so it really <laughs> undermined your experience. Yeah. Yeah. Feel, yeah. 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 And did you then start to doubt yourself? You do, yeah. yeah. And I thought, oh, maybe I did. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I made this up. Can yeah. I do this? Like, yeah. And it yeah, makes you not want to do it. Yeah. It's so, so sad. Like. Yeah, it is. And Krishna says some really, like, profound things about it later in the chapter. They're just about that very thing. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. So that's probably where I want to go to next. Do you guys have any more questions about that first illustration? Diana? I just had a question about um, why Lizzie was so afraid to approach um, and talk to her sister with more love when Kushner encouraged her. I was like reflecting on that and I thought, why was she afraid? So it would be great to get some insight on that. This is where, um, um, on which page? Um, it's a, now appeared to be Kushner's time for action and then he was encouraging her to speak. Yep. to her sister and then um, encouraging her more strongly to do that. And um, that was like right at the beginning where she went around the first... just before yep. she went around the first time mm-hmm. and said to her, um, Sarah, dear Sarah. And, and just before that and it said she was trembling with fear. Um. 
Oh, you mean Lizzie herself Lizzie. was afraid. Lizzie, yeah. So can you empathise yeah. with Lizzie? Why was, do you think she... Can anyone yeah. else think why she might be afraid? Lorleen? Um, my feeling was that she uh, also has this feeling that she, there's a, a distance between them. Like, she's dead. And, yeah. and, and, and in this, she's even amazed she's there. And then the shock of being there. And then, well... I can communicate, yeah. can I? You know, it, and, and it's... What's going to happen yeah. next? Like, yeah. what, is it, you know, is this going to work? This is all new. This is all, like, what is going on, really? You know, I, this is all strange. Like, I think that's really what was happening. Yeah, yeah. She's afraid of what might happen. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Lorleen, back to Lorleen. Yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to ask uh, how, when he helps um, Sarah... Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, what, the girl on Earth. Is it Sarah? He yes. helps um, Sarah to hear. You know what I mean? He says, uh, in there, there's somewhere he he, um, he said that he would help Sarah to to hear. Is that right? Yes. And I wondered how he does that. What what does actually transpire there? How do you guys reckon that he might help? China, yeah, and Deidre, yeah. I feel that he would lend some of his love and and his his truth and energy to to the interaction. To the interaction. And and also think about if I can I can feel Deidre's feelings and Deidre can feel my feelings. If yeah, if I project a lot of love at Deidre, a lot of it's okay, you know, and at the whole situation, and I'm in a really high position of love. If if Deidre's in any way humble and open, then that will kind of help her as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Deidre? And I just thought, um, because it's Kushner's love and obviously he's at one with God or higher, yeah. it would um, kind of like just let the other spirits step Back. Whoever else might so be they muddying can't the block exactly her thoughts. because what nearly happened earlier on with Fred. If you yeah, if you pass back to Pamela, yeah. He was so eager to help. He wanted to step forward. Yes, and why do you think Krishna stopped him? Because it was important for the natural flow between the two girls to occur. Yes. Yeah, it was important not to muddy it with someone else's feelings in the mix of like, oh, I want to make it better. And then it, it would be very confusing for Sarah, wouldn't it? There's a lot of power in it just being Lizzie and Sarah. Yeah. And, and Fred was quite amazed how Kushner was just absolutely still. Yes. And appeared not to be doing anything, but he was waiting yes. for the right moment. He knew yes. when. Yeah. And isn't that a beautiful illustration of how we can use our soul you know Kushner is this expansive being with all this love and desire and everything but he knew in that moment it's best for me to just really be with me and allow this thing to happen because there's more power in it happening that way yeah yeah Gary it, it feels like he was just waiting for the flicker of a desire like for her to know something else and, yeah. and he knew, he could feel when that was the right thing. Yeah, he, he really knew and also that the girls became more and more in sympathy with their, their care and regard for each other, that that was growing and also the other feelings, the loss, all of that was growing and he knew that the optimum moment for them to communicate, which would be the thing that would alleviate so much of Sarah's pain because a lot of her pain just comes from a false belief um he knew that if he waited until they were in the most rapport this is when she would be most likely to hear and so you're right he was just waiting for that moment yeah jennifer it seems to me that there's a deeper truth happening here in that the deeper truth is is that what's being enabled is the understanding that there is life after death and that and all the other little int intricacies that's going on between the rapport between the two sisters there's like a bigger 
a bigger, bigger picture. It's an illustration, an, isn't it, of yeah, something being much bigger? Enabled through um, the interactions of all the characters that are playing these little parts, like in that the bigger picture is also the transformation for Sarah's life, in that she realizes things about her own emotions, the transformation of her loss, the understanding that there is life after death. Mm -hmm. But the bigger picture is is that like you know, we really do have an eternal existence or the potential of one. Yes, yes. And Krishna or Fred says something here. Remember Fred, and remember Sarah doesn't carry that truth with her, does she? Because her family kind of pull her down. But Fred gets so excited, doesn't he? Mm. He's just beautiful in his in his exclamation of like, wow. And he, he quotes the Bible, and I'm just not sure exactly where it is. Yeah, here he says, um, if what I had just witnessed was not all it appeared to be, that is, if it was real and not a dream, death was a chimera. 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 <laughs> Chimera, which would presently disappear, and the declaration of Christ to Martha, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die, would become a literal fact instead of a spiritual illustration. He's saying, this is amazing. Everyone's going to know. It's true. You live forever. You know? And then, yeah, Bemo. Alwyn, the back. <laughs> Going back one, um, it was also Kushner not having demand or an expectation and also not impinging on their free will, is what I thought. Very good point, Alwyn. Because Fred was almost like desiring, wasn't he, to override the situation and because he could see it would be much better if she just knew she was there. But Kushner knew that that's not my role here. The only way I can do, and it's actually what Gary's saying, the only way I can do this is when they have so much rapport that they actually kind of want to speak a little bit, then I'll be able to help them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, let's skip to... Um, well, we're not skipping. The next bit is... <laughs> um, Fred is very disheartened, isn't he, when he realises that no one's going to believe Sarah and Lizzie is stuck in this feeling still of wanting to placate her family. And what happens to Lizzie? What did you notice about when Sarah went back to the family home? What happened to Lizzie? What did she feel or what suddenly changed? Yeah, Ange? Um, do you mean when she became exhausted or do you, before that? Um, Just before that, when they speak about being in the family home, yeah, and suddenly the sympathy is gone, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, the, and um, it's replaced by all this. There's all this feeling in the family of cynicism yeah. and, you know, arrogance and arrogance yeah. and what was that, Bob? Irky, irkiness. That's what I'm like. Well, authoritative irkiness. prejudice. <laughs> Sorry, Author prejudice. Authoritative prejudice. Yes, yeah. exactly. And immediately, Lizzie is less. She and she feels exhausted, and it's terrible. And she goes back to the spirit world. Yeah, yeah. So Fred's all downhearted, and then Kushner says some pretty awesome things that I thought would be good to talk about, just paragraph by paragraph. So. Um, does anyone know the paragraphs I'm referring to? Because they stood out to me. And um, I think you're referring to um, when Krishna says, I was no means hopeful of such a result. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, experience teaches me otherwise. So he knew that this is probably going to happen, didn't he? Yeah. I should grow more sanguine. 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 Well, your leader really should work on her enunciation before she comes because it ruins sanguine. it. Anyway. Sanguine. I should grow more sanguine if I could see a disposition on the part of mortals to admit the possibility of having attained some knowledge at present beyond, of our having attained some knowledge at present beyond themselves. What does that mean? <laughs> In simple words, what does that mean, Deirdre? That I'm not the centre of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it means... Like, you know, the blinkers. Like. Yeah, if only, mortal, if only people still on Earth would actually think that perhaps we have a brain and we might know some things that <laughs> yes. they don't. Yep, yep. But we cannot expect too much from them so long as they imagine our only employments are singing glory, glory, glory <laughs> or writhing in unutterable torments. <laughs> So you know what he's referring to there, the really Christian viewpoint that you're either with a harp or down in, down in the hills. I read something uh, written by someone today, uh, a guy in the States who was writing about how he'd ask some ministers about um, what heaven would be. And they said, well, it would be just unimaginably beautiful. It would be like a really extended church service. And the guy said... <laughs> Which tends to make people think it'd be more like hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, <laughs> they fight the battle, we wear the crown. They perfect reason and knowledge, we rest from our labours. So again, it's, say, it's talking about the arrogance of earth, isn't it? We have all the knowledge. And Kushner um, talks about this quite a number of times in passing in this book of how everyone thinks they know everything when they're on the earth and they've attained scientific, the pinnacle of scientific understanding and mathematic and all of these things. And yet there's all these incredibly wise people around them with similar passions, but they just won't listen to them. <laughs> Uh, they hold us in rel relative estimation of antiquated volumes upon the shelves of life's library. <laughs> Out of date, <laughs> not reliable guides to follow and certainly extremely dangerous to consult. <laughs> yes, yes. And if you think about that, that's pretty much the majority of the world thinks that, don't they? It's not just Christian people, Yvonne. This, um, this whole theme made me really reflect on this, Mary, because mm -hmm. it's just such a sad indictment because I know for myself I've been so arrogant and my whole life's been about what I know. Yep. And I was thinking about how our whole educational system and um, is all geared to performance and achievement and what I know. And, um, and the truth is what I know on God's scale, I'm not even on the scale. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's um, where the humility has to override the arrogance before we even think that we can learn anything. Yeah. And that's why there was the comment about um, being in this state of authority of prejudice. Yeah. Um, Lizzie's voice would not be heard. Yes. And, um, and so it's... And I, I think you talked about it in the, in the humility talks, about making that shift to... Um, like, like Jesus and you have in terms of being, um, well, realising that we know nothing, like, and realising that God knows everything. So there's a lot, we'll always be learning. Yes. As opposed to the worldview. Yes. I'd yeah. love it for uh, our measure of our worth to go from what I know, what I know. to how well I learn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would be so how good, wouldn't it? How well I learn. <laughs> how much I want to learn, how well I learn, yes. how much I apply myself to learning. Yeah. Yeah. But it also made me um, reflect on the fact that um, this is all, all based on the fact that people think we die and that's it. It's yes. just that one truth. And, and the sadness of that is that's the reason that um, Jesus decided to go through with the crucifixion in the first century yes. so that he could show people that you don't die. Yeah. But then because of the what's happened with the church for the last 2,000 years, and that's also the reason why you've had to come back to teach us that one little thing. If we could just get that one little thing, <laughs> life goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good reflection of the story. <laughs> uh, if we go, Ange, and then to Deb. Yep. Um, that sort of brings to my mind... Um, it's not just that one little truth, but it's also the truth of this rapport. Because for me, I knew I had holy angels, you know, and I called yep. to them since I was 20, 21, yep. Yep. In, when I was feeling good enough, you know, about myself and worthy enough, worthy to, enough yep, and yep. connected enough and, you know, in, in integrity with myself to some degree, I could call to them. But over the years, I got da jaded because I didn't know about this rapport thing. And I think we see so many negative spiritual um, yes. mediumship, whatever, going yes. on, that we then get to the point where it is unreliable and dangerous. Yes. You know? So this, the, the rapport thing is, 
equally as important. It's so important, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And actually, um, AJ and I were talking about it this morning because there's a lot of... Uh, I had a Christian lady email me um, who's following the book group and she was referring to our first meeting where we talked about the preface and the gifts of the spirit. Uh, Robert James Lees talks about how the gifts are ongoing and Christians don't believe that. And she was saying, no, 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 we believe that now in these last days that we receive gifts, um, but it's from the spirit of God. It's, it's not from spirits. Um, because there's this, what I feel is in the past, many Christian ministers have seen how this negative rapport occurs yes. and it yes. does seem dangerous. Yes. 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 And so they've said, no, that's it. Yes. <laughs> it's off. Yes. It's, it's yes. of the no devil. Go territory. Don't, don't do it. Mm. But the interesting thing is when you then open up to saying, well, I can't talk to spirits, but I can talk to God. You actually open that avenue yes. in a far more dangerous yes. way, yes. in my opinion. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, that's right. Yeah. 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 So holding on to this, but you're right. If, if only we understood about rapport from a soul level, yeah. so much would it, change. And it's almost a feeling of this is just physics. Yes. <laughs> this it's, this it's is just, not even emotions anymore. It's just physics and science and I mathematics. Agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Someone else had their hand up. Oh, oh Deb, yeah. Oh, I, I just wanted to um, add to what Joy had said because I, I had um, a little bit of a similar feeling and I just wrote down the, the arrogance of ignorance. Yeah, and doesn't... There's a quote in here somewhere about that where... Um, actually, it's at the end of this part that I want to discuss, but Fred actually says... Um, You're right, Krishna. My idea was unjust because I was ignorant. Mm. So I, I didn't have enough information and it made me come to an unjust conclusion. Yeah. 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 There's so... Honestly, I could go through this book sometimes and just pull out all the one-liners. They're just... Yeah. 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 All right. Let's look at the next paragraph on this page because I just feel these three paragraphs here are very rich in uh, fodder for reflection. <laughs> so... Um, Fred uh, Kushner said all that about the, uh, the false beliefs on earth about what happens in the spirit world. And Fred says, does, this not, does not this discourage you in your work? <sighs> and Kushner says, no, our knowledge of the government of God shows us that all the erroneous ideas of men can only delay. They cannot prevent the, su the success of truth ultimately. What do you feel about that statement? It's an awesome statement, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that truth is, truth is a stronger substance than, a, than anything else, really. It will endure. We just have to have patience. How many of us have patience? <laughs> and faith, yeah, yeah. You want? I think it was... Um during the discussion on um, spirituality and pseudo-spirituality, um, oh, I think I've just lost it. The idea that... Um, sorry, Mary. That's all right. We were talking about patience. Yeah. Oh, I know what it was. Yeah. The point was that ultimately the soul cannot but hear the message. Do you know what I mean? Ultimately, it, the soul will hear the message. It doesn't yes. have any option. <laughs> well, it has that will. It can keep yeah, rejecting, keep rejecting, <laughs> keep rejecting. But ultimately. But ultimately, truth is the, the powerful substance. It's going to overcome error eventually. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's a good design. Mm. Yeah. If we go back here. Did you pass back to awesome. yeah. I love that um, saying, until the last lamb is brought home. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. All right. Um, so going on with what Krishna says. They attach an undue importance to the earth life and transfer the great advantages, which are the peculiar features of this estate, to the earth condition when they do so. Now, was, did that cause anyone to have some reflection on yourself in that? Uh, how do we do that? If we, if we read on, actually, um, with them, everything, with them, which is us here, 
Everything is determined by three score, year, score years and ten. The temporal governs the eternal. The finite controls the infinite. The things which are not are placed in jurisdiction over the things which are. So this is where I'm asking you guys, how does this occur in your life? Deidre? Uh, yeah, with me, like the three scores and ten, like that's 70 years. So like, that's like a like the average lifetime. And it's like, oh, I'm 40, I should have a house. Or, you know, I'm so... I don't know what it is, but money is just like my strongest, yeah. like, uh, constant thought, like the lack of it and competition. Like, if someone wins something, I think I've missed out, like, all this importance I place on the material things and money yeah. and food yeah. and rent. Like, just yeah. having to pay rent, it stresses me out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yeah. But it's all that. And that's, like, the three scores and ten, like, what we achieve. This... In this, this time, time frame, frame, this is where my worth will yep. be defined. Yep. This is where I have to Achieve. get things, do things, all of those things. Yep. And I often see this where people honour their financial, financial life over their spiritual life. Over anything. Yeah. <laughs> I see it all like I see it in you guys too. Yep. You know, it's it's a you know we worry more about the dollars in the bank than we worry about our relationship with God, the condition of our soul, all of those things. And this is Kushner saying, "You guys have got it upside down. Like this is nothing. It doesn't even exist. Well, Your soul that exists. <laughs> this is where I struggle because on Earth." I have to pay rent. Like, I have to. This is what I feel. That if I don't have money, that's it. It's over. That's how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, bugger spirit life. Like, on earth, it's over if I don't have money. And what, hap what happens when it's over? What will happen? <laughs> I don't know. I'm so afraid of that. I won't go there. Well, if it, if it all got to the ultimate hardship and you passed, it'd yeah. be in your spiritual life. <laughs> So it's nothing's over. <laughs> but I agree. Yeah. Like most people have that feeling of dead panic. Yeah, terror. Absolute terror. Of, terror. Yeah. But if you go into your emotion, I have to pay rent. What's the emotion underneath that? Um, yeah, uh, it's kind of almost like a, I don't know if it's like a, a pissed off emotion. It like, is a big yeah, one. Yeah, I can feel it from you. <laughs> Okay, it's a huge pissed off emotion that I have to spend like 40 hours a week just paying fucking rent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. so you're angry about having to care for yourself. Pissed I don't want to have to care for myself. No, no, I don't want to have to work to look after myself. Deidre, there is a wealth of emotions <laughs> underneath that. If you went there, I can guarantee you your spiritual life as well as your financial life would improve <laughs> massively. But most of us just live in the, this is normal, it's, everyone has to pay rent, that's it. You know, and we don't even, we close down so many possibilities. Like, I want to live in a world where nobody pays rent. Uh, that's the world I want to live in. But how are we ever going to get to that world while we're just sitting around going, oh, well, we've got it and I bloody hate it. Do you know? Yes. That's how simple it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, very simple. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the rebellion. And there's the rebellion, Deidre. And I'll say to you very seriously, it's not humility. No, and while you're no. in that place, you're not going to grow. And there's little, uh, honestly, there's little point even studying the book. If you want to live in rebellion, all of you, <laughs> and like the last couple of book groups has been a lot of rebellion coming out of you guys about some of the stuff we've been talking about. If you want to live in rebellion then you don't have to come. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You don't have to engage this process. But it's very... Um, sometimes I think it ends up worse. If you hear all this truth intellectually, then you sit in a nana about it for a couple of years. I've done it, so I'm speaking to you from experience. It's horrible. It drains your life. You end up in horrible other addictions. Mm. You know, you can just walk away... <laughs> Or you can decide to act on the truth that you've heard and become more humble. Recognise. Let yourself know truth intellectually. While I'm in rebellion, truth can't enter my soul. 
when truth can't enter my soul, God's love can't enter my soul. I can't grow in this space. Am I going to make the decision? Am I going to go out of rebellion or live in it? If I'm going to live in it, I might as well just live in it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Okay, Barbara. On this subject, Mary, um, um, most of us and my, my life has all been on the merry-go-round, you know, money and, um, and all of those material things. Um, and the reason for coming here was to change all that, get off the merry-go-round and, and change my life and focus on my spiritual life, which had never given it any consideration before that. So in our household now, um, the question we try to ask ourselves, and we're just learning this, is, um, well, you know, will that decision improve my soul condition? That is such an awesome decision. That's the, that's that's the, question, the question we're to asking. Ask. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I'll tell you something really... Um, big about addiction <laughs> when we make decisions to stay in addiction we cannot lose that addiction we cannot grow beyond that point on that issue when we decide to keep living in addiction we can't move even if we know we're in addiction and we still choose to stay in it we can't shift on that issue if we ask the question is this going to help my soul grow okay, is this an addictive decision I'm making or one that's going to challenge an addiction as soon as I make one that's going to challenge addiction, I open the doorway for my own growth. And it's even down to basic things, you know. Well, what will I do with my rubbish, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, do I, do I put these scraps into this container or do I put them straight into the ground, you know? Yes. What's the better thing for my soul condition? Looking after the earth is better than, you know, not looking after the earth. So we're trying to do that on... On a lot of things now, most things. Yeah, which, yeah. awesome. But it's hey? a great question. Yes. Your soul partner told us that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he says many great things, if you've noticed. <laughs> it's worth going back and looking at a few of those things he said. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Who else had their hand up? If we go here and back to Jennifer at the back. I thought all of the, that paragraph about um, that it referred to wealth and and whatever, it just comes from that feeling of being unsafe underneath it all, doesn't it? Yeah, that we don't want to feel, so we live in it. But it's not just about wealth, is it? What else could Krishna be referring to in this passage? What are the things you think we put above our spiritual life? Everything. <laughs> what are some of the things on that list? Uh, Jennifer? Knowledge. Knowledge? Like intellectual knowledge, yep. There's a huge E. Anyone else? Uh, yep. Just call them out if you want. Comfort. Power, comfort. Or oh, comfort is a big one. Fame. Fame, yep. Yeah, even more. What is the thing I want to put at the top of this list? Family. <laughs> How many people give up on a dream because their family disagrees, following their soul's desire? You know, how many people give up on a spiritual path because everyone goes, you're in a cult? You know, this, the desire for family's acceptance and approval is, is something we put above our relationship with God so often. And it happens in little day-to-day -day decisions as well. We can get in back. We can make progress on, say, an emotion. Hey, that we're that we're working on breaking an addiction. We're starting to feel a bit shaky around it. We might even have a few cries. We realise this is wrong in our life. Then, boom, mum calls, and it can all go out the window because we really just we don't really want to deal with this more than we want mum's approval or mum's or just peace with mum, you know. And yeah, so I feel that's a big thing. Other people had their hands up. Yeah, Graham? Soulmate. Soulmate, yeah. Can put that above our, our true relationship with God. Forgetting the fact that if we just... <laughs> I'm watching you, your partner giggle here. Um, <laughs> have I been used for a pointed... Uh, <laughs> a point scoring? Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, it's true, though, if we focus on God... Our soulmate's going to be drawn to us when we try to manufacture closeness with our soulmate and at the expense of our own selves and our relationship with God, we get further apart. 
It can't happen any other way. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, anyone else on those ones? Safety. Yeah. I would say um, financial security and safety, physical security, comfort and safety, and family are the, the things that I feel drive most people. Yeah. Yeah. A desire for those things rather than a desire for our true selves and for God. Yeah. If you just pass the mic to you, actually, Jen. What about the influence of time, the time in which things happen, that you're supposed to do things by the time you're 21 and then if you haven't, then there are Similar to what Deirdre was saying, I should have a house by now. Yeah, it's more about worth associated with what society says we should be doing. Yeah, worth. Yeah, worth. But it's not, it's not a real sense of worth. We're defining our worth by other people so we can never actually grow in worth through that process. We're always going to be dependent on that person to give us our worth. And true worth is, is a feeling you have for yourself, a knowledge of yourself, of your own worth. Yeah. Yeah. Jen, you had your hand up before, yeah. <laughs> When I was pondering, um, like, what I give attention to, what's really changed for me in the last, like, just even in the last year is that I realize it's okay for me to make choices now that are going to be really long term. Like, I used to think I had to get everything done in, you know, the 60, 80, 100 years that I have. And now I'm starting to expand that and go, okay, I can give myself permission to start learning how to play the fiddle now at 40 whatever. Yes. Instead of going, darn, I missed the opportunity when I was young. Yes. Because I feel like, you know, I can gain these skills and build this passion and it's going to take me on into the next world. And I just, it's a completely yeah. different perspective. And can you see why Kush, this, you're exactly illustrating Kushner's point, aren't you? When people are bound in this is all it is, it limits them, it makes them prioritise things that aren't real. Whereas when you yeah. have the perspective of, ah, oh, my life goes on and on, I can develop this soul. Actually, I want to. I've got to start now. Yeah. 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 It's like a sense Beautiful. of hope. Yes. And, and excitement. Like I, I used to say to myself, oh, I've missed being a mom. And now I go, that's not true. I mean, yeah. not only are there still opportunities now, but yeah. I mean, there's this whole other experience in the spirit world that who knows? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Very nice. But you're right. This is the, th there's so many gifts of faith and knowledge of truth of God's universe and I feel patience is one of them it's a huge gift that we and I watch my mate and I tell you he has a lot of patience he always has and it's not something that he's had to cultivate like oh, I'll be more patient not at all it's just a product and I can relate to it the more I progress the more patient I become not only with myself but with everyone around me because I have a deeper understanding of what's really going on here, what's involved in real change, but also any little step we make toward a real true soul step towards love and God is not lost. And it is magical <laughs> and, it's, and it's, it's a building block of something bigger that doesn't end on your deathbed. Yeah, so it's beautiful. But it brings me to another point that I was going to raise with you guys. And that is patience versus procrastination. So Kushner has got a lot of patience, doesn't he? He's in this interaction. He's totally patient. He knows, and in fact, I should probably read the next bit. Well, he says that he knows the success of truth ultimately, doesn't he? And so he said that earlier. And he says... Uh, uh, we know better and therefore can wait if needs be. At the same time, we are not unconscious of the advantage of a right commencement. What does that mean? Before we go on to this point, what does he mean by that? Suzanne? I think it's like the bell curve thing. It's, it's like not jumping too quickly and not jumping away. 
but being in touch with the feeling. Yeah, and knowing the perfect time. He, yeah. He's saying, we know it's better to wait, actually, for the time to be right rather than trying to push things because it doesn't work, pushing. But what does he mean by we're not unconscious of the advantage of a right commencement? Do, do you know? Do you want to have a stab? Yeah, that, that, that was what it meant for me. It was like... It's this when something is ripe. It's like you come to the edge of something. Yeah, perhaps yeah. I should let someone else answer. It. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I think Kushner is meaning something different here right. because he's saying actually the world has it upside down. He's saying they're putting all on the um, three score and ten. It's all emphasised there. The, the temporal governs the eternal. The finite, what we have, controls the infinite. Um, and things which are not are placed in jurisdictions over the things which are. We know better. He's saying we know the truth. It's not like that. Your financial wealth is not a measure of your worth and nor is it helping your soul we know better um so we can wait because we know that the soul is going to live on so we can wait to give this truth there's going to be time mm -hmm. it's not a finite three score and ten that we have to let people know this in if we need to we can wait we are not our unconscious however at, at the same time of the advantage of a right commencement yep nina Angela, if you just, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, I reflected on this in my own life, how through my addiction I want a certain outcome and how I act forcibly to create that outcome and what I do is I end up making it worse and delay the inevitable outcome that I want as what I'm learning is when I just kick back and feel you know, why I'm doing that and the unlovingness of it, something happens and it just all flows so easily, so magically and everyone involved in that situation is raised up instead of pulled apart. Yes, definitely. That's true and that's patience. Um, and I want to talk about that more here. But just going back to Kushner's sentence, I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> He's saying, we know, we know that the world's got it all stuffed up. We know that most people are just placing a lot of emphasis on stuff that doesn't really matter. But we also know that you, the end of your earth life is not the end of your life. So we can wait to let them know. But we're not unconscious of the fact that things would go a lot better if people knew from the beginning or knew in a timely way what the truth was about their situation. Just like, you know... We're trying to build your awareness of what the truth is of your situation, which is that you have a spirit body and you have a spirit life and all of these things. You think about it, if you lived your life in that knowledge, that would give you, that's a pretty good commencement, isn't it? To start your journey. You, you, you wouldn't focus on these things as much as you have because you, you would know there's a bigger truth. There's something more important here. Yeah, so that's what he's saying. But let's go back to the patience versus procrastination because I agree, um, Nina, when we have patience, we don't want to rush in and force things. But most of us still don't have that quality, do we? Sometimes things feel bad, we want to just change it or we think, no, I really want this thing and I know the law of attraction is showing me that I'm not attracting it but I'm just going to do an extra shift at work beat myself into the ground so I can buy the new dress or whatever it is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that kind of thing, isn't it? So patience is when we recognise the truth of a situation and we decide, as Nina said, not to force it but to be humble to it, to deal, act, act in ways of love and truth only and then, and then be patient as to the outcome. Now, some people have waited a long time for a lot of things <laughs> on earth because they weren't willing to compromise love and truth. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. And that takes patience. Do you, do you know? Yeah, you're all clear on that. However, what is procrastination? Let me, let me give you a really concrete, like, example. 
say I, I'm somebody else. <laughs> I meet a man and I'm totally attracted to him. I think, wow, he's a hottie. But hang on, upon a bit of reflection, I can see there's quite a bit of addiction in this situation. And I have really decided that I want to be with my soulmate. I've decided that somewhere. It's a concept, you know. But I still really like to be with this person. But given the fact that there's a lot of addiction that I can already see at play, you know, what's ethical for me to do? If I'm ethical, I'll be patient. I won't give in to the addiction because I know that other truth that we talked about, if I give in to addiction, it can never leave me. So I'm going to be patient and humble and realising that if I feel all this, then my real soulmate, even if it's that person, will be drawn into my life. That would be patience. And many people avoid that state, don't they? They go, yeah, yeah, I know the truth, but hey, I've just got to do it anyway. Yeah. Procrastination, on the other hand, is when you're in... This is just an example, but to give you... Because often I see people calling procrastination patience oh just be patient I've just got to work through a few more emotions then things will change Lord, you know when really they're already living in a situation where they are ignoring issues of love and truth and they're procrastinating about confronting them and therefore they're not being patient they're procrastinating so it's very important this quality of patience I think is beautiful it is really a lovely quality. But don't confuse <laughs> procrastination for patience. Because, like I can guarantee, every one of you sitting here, there is some issue in your life where you know some truth that you are ignoring. So you are procrastinating. Until you act on that in a loving way, you are procrastinating and stagnating on that issue. And. <laughs> How am I going for time, by the way? It's uh, 20 past two. Oh, cool. I was just going to say it's very active, patience. Yeah. Yes, it is active, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You might not be uh, moving your feet, but there's a lot going on. Yeah, you're very present. There's a lot of intention in you when you're patient. Intention and desire, yeah. Yvonne? Thanks. I was just thinking of it in, in relevance to... Um, a situation with Jesus actually where I heard him say somebody was asking him about what emotions he needs to shift and he talked about that and he said well you know it could take one year three years or ten years but I'm a very patient person and and, and so it it strikes me that it's to be patient it's got to be in harmony with truth and love mm -hmm. and stay that way yeah without and procrastination would never be in truth let alone in love exactly so, yeah. Procrastination is actually when you're totally avoiding truth, isn't it? If you think about it, yeah. It's de denial of yep. the of the truth. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it's denial of the. If in our case, it's denial of those emotions. Yes. Um, yeah. And when when Jesus says, "I'm a very patient man," what what do you think? Like his intention is, his feeling is, I'm going to stay with what I know to be truthful and loving, for as long as it takes. For me to deal with what it is. I'm not pressuring myself, but I'm not procrastinating either. I'm staying this course and I, I'm having faith. I, you know, I've just got, I'm just going to keep going. It's about staying the course and enjoying the journey. Not, it's, not, it's about the journey, not about the destination. Yes. Whereas I know for myself, I'm often like, well, I want to get to that. Or Often because we measure our worth when we're there, yes. not on the way. We're waiting for the achievement to say, oh, now I'm good. So it's actually more important for us to know that we're on the right way and not worry about anything else. Well, it goes back to what do I value? What I know, what I've done or how well I learn, how I live, how ethically I live. Am I honouring God's truth in every situation? If, if that, To me, that is, like, that's the substance that Kushner is saying is lacking. People don't even want to know this truth about the spirit world. So, you know, it's, they're not even living in any harmony with it. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have a question about that, Mary. Like, um, it, it fascinates me how um, the majority of humankind can decide, oh, well, that's not what we know, so therefore it's wrong. 
and if you follow that path, therefore you're crazy. Yep. How do they get to that so easily? Like with Lizzie, like with Sarah rather, yep. um, because the masses of them, there's that safety in numbers, so they all stick together about what they think is truth and not. Yeah. And then if you step outside that, like a lot of our families do with us, yeah. because you're not in the norm, because you're not going with the majority of the numbers, um, immediately think that we're crazy. So your question, how do they think that we're crazy or why do we... How do they think that? Well, I think there's probably a lot of reasons, all based on th their childhood, what they... The emotional investments in the beliefs in their childhood, in the investments in what is love... Like a lot of people are hugely challenged that we say, well, your parents didn't love you perfectly. Well, that's it. You know, <laughs> that's enough for most people. Or I'm Jesus. This is Mary Magdalene. I'm Mary Magdalene. This is Jesus. <laughs> it's kind of the same. Uh, <laughs> you know, okay, that's it. You're out the door. Like They can do it because there is... Remember last week or the week before or the week before that, we talked about how... Beliefs are emotional. They are emotional. So, you know, it's not, it's not like somebody... In fact, if you think about it, most people don't sit down and think logically. Okay, so this person's saying something that to me seems a bit off, but if I look at it logically, they seem pretty healthy. They're not, you know, doing anything crazy. They haven't taken up with, you know, somebody... I don't know, all these things. If they looked at it rationally, they, then they would go, okay, maybe... Maybe there's something here that so there's something here that's not matching with my belief system, but most people don't do that because they're used to just letting their unhealed emotions drive everything, which we are too, <laughs> you know. I found it really striking when we did the channeling um, of the spirits who come to the group. How many of you wanted to talk about Mandy? And nobody really wanted to talk about the Christian women. And there's totally emotions at play with you guys about that, about how yeah. Well, I don't like talking about the Christians very much, you know? Every time I bring up the Bible, you know? And <laughs> that's the feeling that comes out of you. <laughs> Can we get past this bit, please? And that's all stuff in you guys, you know, that is creating judgments because it's not felt. And so this is how it happens with our people we know when we start to do something different. You know, when... I, if I turned up here with hairy armpits, some of you would just, you know, that would cause something in you, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving that example because that's how small it is. You know, it's this emotions attached to so many different things. <laughs> and that's how easy, that's why it's easy for people to make a quick judgment because there's so many things coming. Yeah. Uh, Deb? <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to mention um, with the Christian lady, it might have been that she was Christian, but for me and um, maybe for the, the rest of us, it, she was really full on confronting. She said that she, we were only interested in what we could get from other people. It was all we were interested. We were interested in giving it all. And I've so, been thinking about that, just going, yeah. oh, my God, like we're so in it, we don't even know that we're doing it, you know. Or well, and my question for you is, for why don't you guys want to talk about that then? If that's that confronting... I'm bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, everyone was like... Ugh. You know, this is what I'm saying. Like if we really want to grow, we'll look at our response to that comment and we'll – is that true? Is that not – you know, we'll look at the response to the hairy armpit. We'll look at everything with a desire to grow in love. Like the question that Barbara was talking about, do we bury the scraps or have them in the container? You know, we'd be thinking about what, what is my assumption about crows? What it, when when I attract them, you know, not just, don't have to make a list, dot point list of every single aspect of the universe, but when I attract something, it's I'm attracting it for a reason. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I have I have very mischievous crows in my life that I'm working on all oh, the time. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> They're like our naughty children. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 What did you come up with Deb, on reflection about this desire to take and not give? Oh, I'm still pretty ashamed, actually, really. Um, that's why I put my hand up, you know, just to kind of... Um, uh, 
and, and I, could, I started seeing it. I don't, it's been filtering through the last, you know, the last little while and just saw how, you know, with my mum and probably her mother and bloody everybody, like everybody just is really interested in themselves. Alice Miller put it the best of anyone I've heard, you know, about the child totally has to be there for the mother and yeah. not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just tragic, really. Yeah. You know? But the thing is, you know how you say you're feeling ashamed? That's fine. Feel it. But don't get caught there, you know. Like, don't don't get into judgment. It's different, you know, this, you know, self-punishing place. Because I, I'll tell you, when we're in addiction, we are taking. So everywhere there's an addiction in our life, I'm interested in taking, not in giving. And many, uh, I, I, yeah, I do see many of you get caught up in this, oh, emotions, processes, oh, it's got to be real love, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. And you stop giving to people around you when you could actually be of service and grow more at the same time. But because everyone, I'll tell you what it is, what I really feel it is, people have had addiction pointed out to them, they don't like it, and they go, oh, I'm not doing anything then because it could be addiction. You know, and that's anger. <laughs> that's totally anger. Instead of humbly saying, thank you for that truth, that's going to change my eternal life. <laughs> uh, that's an amazing, like rapport, addiction, all these things. If only I'd known them when I was 10, but now I know them, I'll run with that. Thanks very much. I'll keep going on trying to honour love and truth in every interaction and be humble when addiction is pointed out to me again and work on changing it and just keep moving through life. I feel like there's a real danger in just being told truth and shutting down, <laughs> you know, and to each other going, well, are you doing that in addiction? You know, all this kind of, isn't that, you know, oh, AJ said, uh, instead of really connecting with your brothers and sisters and being, if you sincerely care about them, you might ask that question, but not in a way to ju just justify more of your anger. And I do see that happening. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my advice, Deb, don't get caught in the addiction of self-punishment about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Jen? I think a lot of the things for me I reflect on what I think I know or what I've been told, the meaning of say something is but when you compare that to what it truly means from God's perspective they're not even on the same page and yet um, I have the feeling inside of me that I've lived a lot of my life moving sideways rather than forward yes because of what I think I know and like I feel that there's a like a cultural understanding of and I think you addressed it lots when what the world believes love is, is what, an example of that. Yeah. When, like, for me, embracing the path is finding out what God... Yes. ..what God's knowledge is on a particular topic, which I find is nothing, not even on the same page or not even remotely similar... Yep. ..to what I think I know about whatever it is. Yeah. And it seemed it, this came up for me in this particular path is that, like, I think I know how to live my life. I think I've got beliefs about what it should look like, what a relationship look, should look, what love looks like, yeah. what compassion looks like. But when you measure that on what God's perspective, God having a relationship with God is like in his truth on, mm -hmm. they're not even similar. No. And what do you feel about that? Challenged, daily challenged because yeah. my belief, because I have inside of me, I don't really know. I'm a little girl, I really don't know. Um, I've come to believe what everybody's told me or what society tells me yeah. or what life is supposed to be like. But isn't the issue that you're now having problem giving up what the world's told you? 
you're not receiving this new knowledge with joy because you're having problem giving it up. And is that really about the knowledge that you have or your investment in the people who gave you the knowledge? Wow, I don't know the answer to that. I reckon it's the latter. (laughs) Children who don't have an investment before they have an investment, that new thing, awesome. Tell me more. New thing, awesome. Chuck that out. Let's go for the next new thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, now I learnt this. Wow. And then I learnt that. And I, that, I learnt that other thing that I learnt wasn't true. And this new thing was. We don't approach this like that, do we? Because there's a lot of feeling. There's two things. There's a lot of feeling of investment in the people who gave us that knowledge. But the second thing is, yeah, we don't want to be humble to the pain that the, the, the pain that will result in giving up this belief. Part of that's related to giving up our attachments to these people, but part of it is about the way I've lived my life. I've lived my life based on these things. Does that mean that everything that I did that didn't help me grow? Or, you know, there's a lot of feeling in that. And the sad truth is the longer we resist that pain, the, the more we perpetuate it. Eventually, we're going to have to feel that pain of giving up this thing that is not serving our spiritual growth. Yeah, yeah. But there's... A, yeah, no worries. I, I was going to say, though, that... All God can do through the law of attraction and all AJ and I can do <laughs> in talking to you is firstly help you raise, and we might even do a talk on this whole thing that I'm going to say in two minutes because I think it's really important, is to help you raise an intellectual awareness of the truth about the universe and the truth about yourselves. And if we're really sparkly, we can help you raise an emotional awareness. You know, by pointing things out, by giving you truth, reflecting things back to you, But that's about it. (laughs) I can give you some encouragement and faith. If I change, you see proof of, you see evidence of what I've been pointing out. Then that helps you also. That's really, God is trying to do this with you with the law of attraction constantly, minute by minute. Intellectual awareness, emotional awareness. What do you have to do? (laughs) Be humble. Nobody else can do that. I can't help you, like, I can't help you feel. God can't help you feel. This is the one task that's up to you. Now, the gifts that come to you from embracing that state are enormous, but it is up to you. And this is where, Jen, I feel like often we're given intellectual awareness of a different truth. We start to have an emotional awareness of it even. But unless we're humble and just feel about that, let go of the attachment we have, really decide, I want to know if that's truth for myself in my soul, then we can't progress beyond this point. That's it. And if we don't embrace humility, we can't receive God's truth for ourselves. Because it's honestly, me telling you God's truth and you feeling it from God, it's like an ant and an elephant in terms of sensation, you know? Like me just telling you, oh, that's cool, feels nice, she's pretty passionate. You know, I I feel attracted to that. But when you feel it, it's like overwhelm, gift, relationship with God, thank you, all of these things that just expand your soul immediately. But you must embrace humility first or it's all dead in the water and we're just stuck here. Yeah. Di, did you have your hand up? I did, but I was just going to say I need to have a desire, but you went on to say that. Yes. Yeah, a desire to move beyond these two states into humility. A desire that exceeds your fear, your anger and your shame. Yeah. And, hey, it'll happen. Stay the course. (laughs) Have patience. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. All right, let's keep going. I thought at one brief moment earlier on we were going to finish this chapter today, but no. (laughs) I get talking and that's it. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so back to Kushner. Um, There's a third paragraph that I thought maybe we could just finish off on. So basically he said, 
the world's got it wrong. They don't understand about the spirit world. They're so arrogant they don't really want to know. As a result, they put all these things in high regard that to us here just seem meaningless and don't actually serve them in the long term. And my homework for you this week is to notice those things that you do put, that you put above your relationship with God. And the third chapter, uh, the third uh, paragraph, Fred says, is not that a somewhat dangerous doctrine to preach? Mm -hmm. So isn't it dangerous to tell people the truth about the spirit world, he's saying. And Kushner says, did anyone feel that? Barbara? Where's the mic on that side? I felt it was strange coming from Fred when he had so much passion to tell everybody about the spirit world that he actually was thinking, oh, maybe, you know, we shouldn't be telling them this. I, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was very strange. Why would Fred be in this position? Jennifer, at the back, do I you just pass back? It seemed apparent to him that when they attempted to give the truth to, um, what was her name? Sarah. Sarah. That, um, that it turned out badly and like his assumption that it was worse that they attempted and then it failed than the fact that they just were able to give some truth. Yeah, that is true, but I don't think that's why he's responded in this way. Uh, Nina? I think he, he's, it actually says here that his concern was that if they knew about the afterlife and that they could make up for it, then that all hell would break loose now. On earth, yes. Yeah. We'd all just like, oh, throw in the towel, do whatever we wanted. <laughs> yeah. But why, why does Fred feel this way is my real question. Angela? I was just going to say he hasn't, he hasn't um, integrated emotionally. Like he's, he's, he's just passed. Yeah. He's lived on earth yeah. all this time with this Christian doctrine fear of a punishing God, he, he still hasn't integrated this fact that w what Kushner is about to illustrate to him, he still feels that fear is probably the best motivator for everyone on earth. And that's a very, uh, it's a very Christian understanding of the, of the way, you know, you, you be a good and moral person. There's hell and, what is it, brimfire in the Bible and all of that, brimstone, yeah. Uh, fire and brimstone, yeah. Um, could it also be that Fred um, desires learning and uh, he's humble enough to ask questions and challenge information for, for that purpose? Yeah, I mean, I think he's asking the question is demonstrating his humility, but I don't think it's a false question on his part. I think he's, he's sincerely going, hang on, couldn't this be a bit dodgy here? Yeah. So Kushner goes on to say, why so? It is the truth. And I have no fear of consequences when the truth is spoken. That sentence is pretty awesome, I think. Yeah. If the declaration of the love of God is not strong enough to draw all men on, unto him, the suppression of that truth or the foundation of any system of terror will never drive men to him. This is also pivotal, isn't it? Yeah. I... I was doing some research on the internet a couple of weeks ago and I came across a, a pastor in the USA called Rob Bell and he published a book called Love Wins and in it he proposed that perhaps hell as Christians don't, as Christians perceive it, perhaps it doesn't really exist because it doesn't marry with what I know about God. Why would God give us all this opportunity for repentance and redemption while we're on earth and as soon as we pass that's it? He said, I can't, I, I have to put the question forward. He didn't want to say, I don't believe it. But he said, I have to put the question forward. Is this really like, is, this isn't very logical. I know a God who's really loving and who really wants our hearts whenever. How do you think the Christian community responded to that? He, I was reading some stuff. He was called the instrument of the devil. I watched people just saying, you know, like, this is danger. This is wrong. You can't say that kind of thing. And really, 
I should say as an aside, he has a huge church, I think 10,000 people. Like, There's other people who agree with him. But what it made me think about is if a Christian is only being Christian for the fear of hell, have they really got a relationship with God? And why are they afraid of people not believing in hell? Wouldn't it only be because they want them to, to believe in it? And to also to, for people who aren't good to be punished. And both of those things are not actually love, are they? Yeah, yeah. I just thought that was interesting. And uh, I thought of it when I read this where he says, any system of terror will not drive people to God. So if we're living in fear of God, and many of us have those emotions in us, hey, still have fear of God. We're not, it's the promise of his love that's going to bring us to him, not this fear of him. Yeah. Okay. When God has formulated a plan of salvation, it only shows you how man arrogates all knowledge to himself when he declares to step in and revise and correct it. <laughs> Which is fairly typical, isn't it? We've said, there's that Bible revision or that... <laughs> well, there's a Bible in the first place. We'll summarise everything to... Yeah. 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 So, and then Fred voices his concern. How would everyone live? And Kushner says these amazing things about... Well, hang on. <coughs> what if you told them the whole truth? about what you observe with Marie, what you've, what, everything you've observed since you've passed, would that really drive people to just throw caution to the wind and be terrible if they knew what they would have to go through? Yeah. And that's where Fred says, obviously, I was ignorant. Julianne? And if you just pass across here. Do you know, Mary, when I read that, I was reflecting on churches uh -huh. and one of the first things in most churches that you see is Jesus hanging on the cross, bleeding, um, nails in his hands and feet. And he, oh, straight away you're in fear of, oh, my gosh, you know. So you walk into a church not with thinking God's love. I don't ever remember walking into a church ever as a Catholic thinking, oh, this is a place of worship for God, I'd walk in and see a terrible situation that you know, if, if it was in your own life, you'd be horrified. And yeah. yet here we worship in a church with seeing somebody in terrible pain. I mean, yeah. it just, all you ever have is, is fear. Yeah, yeah. So that brought up a lot of that of for that me. Of that feeling. That yeah. feeling that the churches are all about the fear mm. that... God's love was never really, if it was said, it was just said quickly. Yes. You know, but a visual is much more full of impact, <laughs> yes. isn't it, than, yeah. than yeah. something that's said. Yeah. And obviously all Christians don't have this feeling or their faith is not solely based around it for this guy to come out and say, hang on, I can feel God's loving. And he points out, he says, most Christians feel like Jesus came to save them from God. Yeah. What? From God's punishment, you know? And doesn't that mean God is bad? And that doesn't make sense. And so he raises some really good logical arguments. So he's obviously not caught up in that trap of fear. Yeah. So I don't believe all Christians are, but I agree. Many of us who've been raised in Catholicism or other faiths end up with this huge anger at God, really, and a fear. Yeah. 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 Mm. Gary? Yeah, um, being a Catholic, I think it's um, ex-Catholic. <laughs> um, I think it's more like, you know, that your whole belief system is invalidated. Like, I, I think there's a lot of fear around that. And I think, like, pertaining to all of us, you know, with, with money issues, if, if that fear is invalid, like, where do I go and what do I do now? Yeah. Like, like there's this nothingness after, you know, say God's a loving God and now I have to like rejig my, my whole lifetime of, of beliefs. So that's like pretty, you know, it takes a bit of humility to do that and so yeah. we, we, we'd rather deny it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like when I said to Deidre, it's not real. And she looked at me like... <laughs> you want to be in my shoes? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you don't want to be in my shoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. It just goes back to that thing that I was discussing earlier, hey? We have to have the humility in order to change our beliefs. Yeah, yeah. How's our time? That's probably three, is it? Ten to. Ten to. Okay. 
All right. Anyway, I just thought that little passage with Kushna had a huge amount of um, wisdom in it, hey? And a lot of fodder for reflection, if you think about it, you know, how much am I living like this is it? How much, and as I said, that's your homework for next time. How much, notice, notice in your week, notice yourself. Am I doing this because I have absolutely no faith in the fact that my life will go on? How much fear is driving this, <coughs> this decision? Or how much am I living in faith? How much am I putting the priorities on my spiritual life? Raj? I, I was channeling um, my guides uh, one day and uh, it's really relevant to the comment you made about um, learning to play the fiddle. Yes. Right? And it was like uh, I really seen my life as being terminal yep. and it seemed that there was no need to keep any momentum going as I get into the older years. Yeah. Like learning to do something. Yes. Uh, why would I bother to learn a language if I'm 85? Yeah. You know, and you kind of sort of wind down those things. Uh, start a business, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. And uh, they said it's much better to pass with a full momentum of life going because you will take that with you into the next, yeah. next place and the momentum will carry you over the void between the two two areas like two places the two you know the earth and the spirit world yeah. it will carry you over the over the hump because you're you're like a, a car with momentum or a boat with with yes. a speed up it's a beautiful illustration yeah and you know what i feel the momentum is passion absolutely when you are embracing your soul's passions that has a momentum of its own that has a it's a it's an invigorating thing you see a person in their passion mm. it's it's almost irresistible isn't it you're like oh that person is really like wow i want to spend time with them or i want to pay attention to them yeah and i just that is a beautiful illustration that they've given you i feel because very often you know at young, in our younger years we do develop our passions, don't we? And sometimes then we have pitfalls or things happen, disappointments, and we're not humble to, what, to what's gone on. And so it stagnates. And then maybe after 10 years we go, I hate my job. You know, I need to change. I'm going back to university or, or whatever. And we might expand a little bit again. But sadly, as you said, by the time most people reach retirement, They've already started to think, well, you know, what's the point of going and do something new now? Or I've been in this relationship for so many years and this is we've made a peace with I'm not entirely happy, but we've made a peace with it. And so we just stay stagnating. And what happens? We literally start to shrink. You know? And so by the time most people pass, they don't you know, many They're people don't leave dead. their house. Yeah, well, they're almost dead, yeah, <laughs> which is ironic, yeah. But, yeah, many people, fear has become... I used to work in the community with elderly people and for many of them, fear has become such a huge thing that their, their world has actually shrunk to a house and maybe a grocery store if they're mobile, but, you know, and that's it. And they have their family come and go and maybe one or two friends, but for many people, it's just that big. And if you think about what's happening to your soul in that state, you're just letting fear win, letting fear win, letting fear win every day. And so you're going to be shrinking. So I agree. Raj, I can't wait to see what language you're going to be learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. I think that's a great place to finish. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah.